So question number nine. Should India consider phasing out nuclear power as a source of energy? Examine the risks associated with nuclear power and the potential benefits of transitioning to renewable energy sources. So a question to the important question of the GS paper T section or carne, GS paper T number or 250 words. Let's come to the answer part. Nuclear energy plays a critical role in achieving sustainable economic and social development. Yes, nuclear energy also a source for sustainable economic and social development. Modern civilization heavily depends on energy for daily activities. Energy is like a lifeline for the sustenance and progress of the entire world. And nuclear energy plays a vital role in the world economy by generating jobs, income, and facilitating trade on a massive scale. So all of I mean nuclear energy port column, then expanded use of nuclear technology offered immense potential to meet important development needs. In fact, to satisfy energy demands and to mitigate the threat of climate change, two of the 21st century's greatest challenges, we know that current day we have two important uh, concerns that to be addressed. First one is the energy demands. Because we are an energy deficient country, we depend on others for crude oil imports. Then similarly, one another reason is uh, climate change. Climate change is a problem for the whole world. So to satisfy the energy demands and to mitigate the threat of the climate change are the two of 21st century's greatest challenges. And there are major opportunities for expansion of the nuclear energy. So we can, with nuclear energy, we can handle this or we can address to treat or greatest threats of 21st century. First, energy demands. Second, the threat of climate change. Global scenario. The use of nuclear power is rising even in Europe and the US. China has been charging ahead on nuclear power. South Korea's new president has changed the energy policy and committed to increasing the share of nuclear power in the country's energy mix to 30% by 2030. Japan, Japan is also restarting nuclear reactors. 10 have been restarted following years of inspection and upgrading the safety system. The UK has said that without scaling up nuclear power, it will not be possible to decarbonize the electricity sector. So we have seen, we have gone through a few examples of uh, some developed economies, Europe, US. Then we also have seen about China, South Korea, Japan, UK. Even UK already declared that without scaling up nuclear power, it will not be possible to decarbonize the electricity sector. Now, what are the potential and benefits of nuclear energy as a source of power? Thorium and uranium reserves. We know that our India has vast reserves of thorium that can fuel in India's nuclear energy provided appropriate technology. We have a vast reserve of thorium. We should not forget it. So we can better utilize it. India's thorium deposit estimated at 360,000 tons. So almost 360,000 tons and natural uranium deposit at 70,000 tons. So see the number 360,000 tons of thorium deposit, 360,000 tons of thorium deposit and 70,000 tons of uranium deposit. So we have a large or vast amount of this new uh, means thorium and uranium <coughs> uranium deposits right the country's thorium reserves make up 25 percent of the global reserves so energy poverty if we compare india with other perspective then 
let's see although india is the third largest producer of the electricity but about 20 percent of the population of the country does not have access to electricity today we are the third largest producer but still maximum parts of our country are not having access to electricity today. The per capita consumption of electricity is very low at about 1,180 kilowatt per hour per annum. So about half of the world average, that is about half of the world average and way below that of the advanced countries. So per capita consumption of electricity is very low in case of India. There exist shortages or in energy and thick power in the range of 10 to 15 percent. See one side we have thorium reserves of 25 percent. That of the means 25 percent of the global reserve. And another side we have seen that per capita consumption of energy is electricity is very poor. That is half of the world average. And there exists shortage in energy and peak power in the range of 10 to 15 percent. Energy demand. Nuclear energy is a critical part for India's future energy security. As we know that India's annual energy demand is expected to rise to 800 gigawatt by 2032. It is very important to consider every source of energy in the optimum energy mix. So by 2032, our energy requirement will be rising to 800 gigawatt. So it is the time that we have to think about it and find some optimum energy mix. Then energy efficiencies. Quantities of nuclear fuel needed are considerably less than thermal power plants. For instance, 10,000 megawatt generation by coal. Coal. I mean, coil will need 10, 30 to 35 million tons of coal. See, only for 10,000 megawatt generation, we need 30 to 35 million tons of coal. But nuclear fuel needed will be only 300 to 350 tons. So see the difference. So that's, that's what is known as the energy efficiency of nuclear fuel. Now, economic growth, rapid economic growth is also critical to achieve developmental objectives and poverty elevations. A sustained economic growth about, of about 8 to 10 percent is needed over the next few decades. As electricity is a key driver for economic growth, it is necessary that there is a massive augmentation in electricity capacity apart from transmission and distribution system. Then decrease in energy supply. Energy supply has been negatively affected by changing weather patterns as water reservoirs de decreases due to lower precipitation and increased evaporation capacity for electricity production from hydropower and other water intensive generation technologies may decline. And that is a fact. Because nowadays, our demand kini water reservoirs as a hekini taking toka water amount to come go say our lower precipitation or carne hog, but increase evaporation or carne hog, a bilak hak pai go say. So our to hydropower based electricity production that is decreasing on the means comparatively decreasing. So we cannot depend on water intensive generation technologies. Then climate change, due to its emission-free nature, nuclear energy can contribute to global efforts under the Paris Agreement. India's nationally determined contribution, that is NDC, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change has outlined goals to reduce the carbon emission intensity of its economy by 30 to 35 percent by 2030, as well as increase the clean energy electricity capacity to 40 percent of the total installed capacity in the same period. Amar Zikini nationally determined contribution as a goal Raki Swami, right, as part of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and that is to reduce the carbon emission intensity of its economy by 30 to 35 percent by 2030, and to increase the clean energy uh based electricity capacity by 40 percent so amar zikini carbon emission base mane um, <coughs> zikini electricity hoy 
Hekini production go to carbon emission, which he to amid thirty to thirty five percent. We try to reduce by twenty thirty, and by that time, we try to increase our clean energy electricity by forty percent. So that can be possible only if we go for this uh, nuclear based uh, energy products production. But everything is not positive as we think about because risks are there in the case of nuclear energy. So let's discuss about risks posed by nuclear energy. India's domestic uranium reserve can support only for 10,000 megawatt of energy. So our future potential depends upon development of third stage of nuclear program. Otherwise, there will be again over dependence upon imported uranium as it, it is the case with the oil currently because you know we are just uh, means uh, importing crude oil from different countries, even from Russia also. So hence, long-term strategy will be only determined when the third stage is functional. So we have to wait for that. Then current nuclear reactors consume significant amount of water. So most of the upcoming plants will be set up near sea coast because it needs a lot of or significant amount of water. Then it will put pressure on the coastline as India's, India's western coastline is home to fragile ecology of western Ghats. Really, because when Western Ghats site, we have a fragile ecology. So it, this, this type of nuclear-based production may put some pressure on the coastline. Further, till now only 21 plants have been operational. There are long question or long distribution uh, periods which increases cost of the plant significantly. So till now we have only 20 plants operational. And long because of the long gestation periods, that will increase the cost of the plant significantly. So only a nuclear energy industry revolution in the future in the nuclear energy can make this achievable. So we need some revolution in the nuclear industry. So then only it is possible what we are aiming for. New safeguard requirement pose. New safeguard requirements, you know, the safeguard requirements should be there, like high risks are there. Like new safeguard requirements post, Fukushima Digester has pushed per MW cost, megawatt cost of nuclear reactors significantly higher in comparison to thermal, solar, and wind plant. So now, post Fukushima Digester has set up some standard requirements, safeguard requirements, and to uh, the means to uh, uh, take care of that, to take care of that safeguard issues or to care, it means to go through them, we need a lot of uh, money or we, we need a lot of invest uh, in this nuclear sector. And that is more higher, that is more significantly higher with, in comparison to thermal, solar, and wind plants. Then, Zaitapur plant in Maharashtra is expected to cost 21 crore per megawatt in comparison to other sources that cost only 8 to 10 crore per megawatt. It is to be seen that whether differences of operational or running costs justify such higher capital expenditure on nuclear plants or not. Some argue that total cost of a nuclear lifestyle which involves mining of uranium, then transportation and storage, capital cost of the plants, processing and reprocessing of plants, possible disasters, and then handling of waste generated for hundreds of years is significantly more than economic value generated during the lifetime of the functioning of the plant, which is generally 40 to 50 years. So generally the plant has a lifetime of 40 to 50 years, but it is going to cost you more than 100 years of course. So it is a matter that is questionable. Then nuclear installation will be favorite targets of terrorists, also in case of war, which can cause irreversible damage to people living in the nearby areas. Suppose this installation will be mean, captured by some terrorist group, then God knows that what will happen to those in the nuclear needs, how they will use it. In long run, if worldwide dependence on nuclear energy increases, it will be most unavoidable way of nuclear 
proliferation as interest and attempt to invest in indigenous industry will increase. Otherwise, smaller countries will continue to buy relevant technologies or components from a few West countries which will serve the private interests of you. India does not yet have credible waste disposal policy and infrastructure in place. Now how India can leverage nuclear energy safely in its energy mix? India has very limited growth potential for hydropower because of the conserving biodiversity and the cost of rehabilitating and compensating the landowners. The alternative to coal is just nuclear power, and India has 210, that is 210 gigawatts of coal capacity, and it produces 73% of electricity of India. Nuclear is only about 3.2%. Business as usual cannot continue. One of the major reasons for the lack of growth in nuclear power is because of the monopoly. All reactors are operated by the Nuclear Power Corporation of India Limited. So monopoly is there. There is a need for a civilian nuclear program. Other government companies like the NTPC should be allowed to produce nuclear power to achieve net zero by 2070. There is a need for 100 gigawatts by 2050. So we, we, you all know that we have a net zero goal by 2070. So there is for that will need 100 gigawatts by 2050 that there is a need for a combination of small modular reactors and large reactors but it cannot be done by one company it has to be done by multiple companies so <clears throat> What we can conclude then, there is a need of a range of options. Energy is not going to be the one thing that solves all the, our problems. It is going to be a mix of supply side and demand side. There is a need for a portfolio of technologies within the nuclear sector and outside the nuclear sector. The energy policy should be about enabling frameworks for all such technologies. It should not be a bad for one technology. So that's it. That's the conclusion. So I think it's very uh, easy to understand about these issues and the benefits of nuclear power. Now let's come to the next question. What is the third gen web? How is it different from the previous generation of internet? How does the third gen web? Third gen means uh, we are talking about third generation. So how does the third generation web aim to provide equal access to information and services and what technologies does it utilize? So this is again from science and technology sector, GS paper three, 250 words. So now web 2.0 or third gen web is a decentralized internet built on an open blockchain network that is not owned and controlled by large tech entities. It is the third generation of the internet currently being built and there where website and app will be able to process the information in a smart human way through technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, decentralized leather technology and many more. So first point you have to remember that web 3.0 third generation web is a decentralized internet uh, just a minute i forgot to show you one thing when i was discussing about nuclear energy because in the case of nuclear energy two important concepts is there that is nuclear fusion and nuclear uh, fusion nuclear fusion, uh, fusion so the nuclear fusion means this is the neutron this is uranium 235 then u236 now what happens, you see there are several others being produced after the fusion. Then nuclear fusion means it means from one we colliding other, this mass uh, energy will be produced when this collision will take place. But in the case of nuclear fusion, what will happen? You see deuterium, you see tritium, and when they fuse, then neutron and helium is produced. So in one case, collision is taking place and another case, fusion is taking place. So don't be confused with this two term, nuclear fusion and nuclear fusion. It is a very uh, means uh, favorable topic in any government examination nowadays. Again, come back to our discussion of the web 2.0 technology. You can see that these are the different weapon, uh, web 3.0 economy. 
see blockchain, crypto, NFTs, metaverse. Metaverse is a very uh, current day trending topic. Then smart contracts, DeFi, decentralized stores. So these are the technologies under Web 3.0. Now, how it progressed, see Web 1.0 was there. Then Web 2.0, Web 1.0 means grid shoots of e-commerce desktop browser access dedicated infrastructure was there but web 2.0 where we, we can see this this mass technology then social networks mobile first always and cloud drive and competing then now web 3.0 in web 3.0 we have ai driven sources or services then may mostly decentralized data architecture and edge computing infrastructure. Remember these three things at least, AI driven services, decentralized data architecture and edge computing infrastructure. So that is based on evolution of the web from web 1.0 to web 3.0. Our India's push towards digital public infrastructure and the deployment of the Internet of Things in the development projects offer significant possibilities for deploying Web3. You know, five key features of Web3 is are ubiquity due to decentralization, semantically organized, autonomous and artificial intelligence, spatial web and 3D graphics. So, <clears throat> and another most important one is decentralization through blockchain. Remember, ubiquity due to decentralization, semantically organized, autonomous and artificially intelligent, spatial web and 3D graphics, and most importantly, decentralization through uh, blockchain. These are the comparison, no need to mug up. Just remember what are the potential of third version web first intellectual property rights protection digital tokens minted by web t platforms can enable india's handicraft industry to secure their innovations so intellectual proprietary rights protection will be there with the help of digital tokens then rapid dissemination of grassroots innovation web three based instruction tools can enable master artisans to share their innovations with fellow members and improving the economic fortunes of craftsmen and artisans communities in the northwest western and peninsular india so now everything can be shared very easily means rapid dissemination of grassroots innovations then deployment in rural rural areas web 3.0 can be used to provide data analytics and insights in rural development projects like manrega mapping the water use habits of the communities and improving early warning system you know, for floods. So we can deploy it in rural areas like uh, to provide data analytics insights in rural development projects like we have Manrega. Then community data analytics, weapon, web 3.0 analytics systems can be used to analyze community data generated by IoT enabled development programs like Zell Jeevan Mission, providing valuable insights. So community and through community data analytics, we may have valuable insights of different IoT enabled program, programs like the one we have currently, Zell Jeevan Mission. Then tokenization for development programs. India's National Blockchain Strategy 2021 proposes to explore tokenization and apply blockchain solutions for the development of the programs, making Web 3.0 is a useful tool for achieving this goal. So we have a Indian uh, National Blockchain Strategy, right? And that proposes to explore tokenization and applying blockchain techno solutions for the development programs. And this makes web 3.0 a kind of useful tool for achieving this goal and creation of distributed economic system like native digital tokens central bank digital currency and the cryptocurrency would be used for monetary circulations and making the transaction fast traceable and effortless so these are the parts of distributed economic system then creation of an ownership economy web 3.0s non-custodial wallets function as a digital passport for users to access blockchain enabled transaction platform using these creators themselves control their content and thereby fundamentally they work as digital proof of their identity but however some challenges are still there potential challenges of web 3.0 Decentralized networks and smart contracts you 
pose significant learning curves and management challenges challenges for IT, not to mention everyday web users. So we need to learn many things about it before using it, right? The complexity of this fund Foundation technologies make Web 3.0 security a real challenge. Smart contracts have been hacked. Security incidents on blockchains and cryptocurrency exchanges make national news nowadays. Then regulatory concern, the lack of a central authority means the regulatory and comp compliance regimes that help keep online commerce and other web activities safe for users are ineffective and non-existent. So the lack of central authority to control these things are absent. So this this makes it inactive and ineffective and non-existent. Then technical requirements are more. Blockchains and the apps are often resource intensive and require expensive hardware upgrades in addition to the environmental and monetary costs for their energy use. So these are the some potential challenges with respect to Web 3.0. Now, how can we conclude the new internet created by Web 3.0 will provide more digital ownership and sovereignty in any in an increasingly digitized world? You know, current days we all moving towards a an digitized world, and in such world, Web 3.0 will give you a kind of digital ownership and sovereignty and other decentralized benefits that I hope will help to establish a more equitable web. This will be achieved by empowering each individual user to become a sovereign over their data and creating a richer overall experience thanks to the media of innovation that is to come once it is in place. So these are the benefits are there, right? These are the benefits that we have through Web 3.0, like decentralized architecture, and you can say sovereignty is there, ownership, digital ownership is there, our data, our right, we have sovereign over our data. But for that also, some kind of awareness is there, some kind of central authority is there who will regulating these things because the lack of such central authority will make it kind of treat for common users like us, like not us, like me or some others who are not so much, I think, uh, technologically advanced. So this must of knowledge, first,